Greetings and thank you all for attending the SHP Project Showcase. We're honored to have four featured graduates from the Sustainable Homes Professional uh, Program, and they're gonna be exhibiting their final projects with us today. You'll meet a participant who took the class back in 2020, back in the day when this was an 84 hour, <laughs> six month long course. Uh, Earth is, is, is Vantage is pleased to now offer a consolidated uh, version, which is a 15 hour online training launched in the spring of 2021. And I think you'll see by the caliber of presentations uh, from this past year's graduates that the online format offers the same quality training, but just now in a convenient online platform. <clears throat> so uh, for those who are new to SHP, SHP is a in-depth field tested online training program for industry professionals who are looking to take their practices to the next level of quality training, of quality building. So training topics covered in SHP are designed to maximize the health, comfort, durability, savings and sustainability uh, benefits for your home buyers and clients. The benefit of an on-demand class is that you can actually sign up at any time we do plan to offer this showcase again in the fall. So whether you're midway in the process of completing SHP or you're a new registrant, uh, there is plenty of time to complete your projects before the next SHP. So by attending today's session, we hope that you will be encouraged and inspired by our speakers and have an appreciation for the level of training endured to become one of the SHP uh, accredited alumni. So if following this course, you're still kind of on the fence about signing up for SHP, just to let you know that you could actually sign up for individual models so that you can sample before signing up for the whole SHP program. <clears throat> SHP um, content is everything from training videos to recorded site tours. We do offer live webinars. We're gonna be doing the online level series again uh, in 2022, but guest speakers, product demos, and as a 15 hour course, it's just a really great way to just knock out as many of your CEs in one shot. So with it, uh, upon completing final projects as our speakers, we'll also become the uh, SHP designation. So the Sustainable Homes Professional. So this cutting edge design uh, and building best practices training is one of the more robust trainings for the industry. We do offer a $100 discount for Earth Advantage professionals, Energy Trust Ally members, and Zero members. We offer $200 off for affordable housing providers. So if you uh, are currently an SHP, just want to let you know that um, we do have a referral program that if a, a colleague of yours signs up, they just need to put their name in what's kind of the group box feature. But then also, too, there is that group discount that if two of your colleagues want to sign up for more, we do offer a $50 discount. And that $50 discount is on top of some of the other discounts here provided off that general admission. So to learn more, and I'll put this in your chat as well, uh, but this is the web link in order to learn more about the SHP program. So a couple housekeeping items. Uh, please put any questions you might have in the chat. At the end of each speaker session, we're going to be looking at those questions uh, in the chat feature. Um, we are going to be doing an extended Q&A. This will be held from 1.30 to 2. There's no CEs for that half hour um, segment, but uh, it is available for you. Uh, you will be getting a copy of the presentation slides. And those will be emailed to you after today's session for those who attended in full. And we're also going to make the video available as well. So uh, certificates of attendance will be uh, emailed and CEs processed within seven to 10 days. You do get credit for attending the whole hour. Um, one request that we do have, and it helps us just for tracking attendance, um, look at the name that's in your Zoom box and make sure it identifies you by name. Uh, if it says anything like iPad or uh, a relative's name, um, please change it over to your own. And that's how we can match attendance. So 
now the moment you've all been waiting for. Uh, let's introduce the host of this first ever SHP project showcase, Stefan Adie. Stefan is not only a former SHP graduate, but he has been teaching the class since 2010. Stefan is one of four SHP instructors from the online SHP course. Stefan founded Green Hammer in 2002, and he is a certified passive house consultant, building science expert, and he has been the pioneer of Oregon's green building movement and has been involved with many of the nation's highest scoring lead platinum homes and residential commercial passive uh, house building in the Pacific Northwest. And we are honored to have him with us here today. So Stefan, let you go ahead and take it away. Awesome, thank you, Ali. Super excited to be here. We've got a really great group of presenters. And uh, yeah, it's fantastic. It, it's a proof that 80% of my time over those 10 years, um, the 84 hour course was maybe 80% of hot air because uh, certainly the, um, the folks who took this online have gained an incredible amount of knowledge in the uh, greatly reduced version. So awesome. SHP has just been an amazing resource and it's a really great community. I know there's a lot of SHPs on this um, webinar right now. And I don't want to delay any further because we really want to get through all these presentations and they've got a lot of great content. So we're going to start out in this order. We're going to be beginning with Mark uh, Grismer, who's a construction project manager for Green Canopy Node. And then we're going to move on to Grace Wager, site supervisor for the Ben Redmond Habitat for Humanity. Then Maggie Bates will be uh, reviewing her project as a design manager of A1 Design Build. A lot of you folks on the webinar here, so glad to see you. And Benjamin Bungartz, who's the co-founder of Revel Home. And I'm gonna kind of avoid any introduction of their presentations because I'd like them to actually just focus on the presentation and the time. So with no further ado, we're gonna kick it off with Mark Grismer. All right, thanks, Stefan. Um, <clears throat> and as one of the last in-person classes with SHP, it was not hot air. It was all great. It was an honor to be in your class. Hopefully, my presentation can illustrate some of the things I've learned. <laughs> uh, my name is Mark Grismer. I'm project manager with Green Canopy Node. Today, I'll be presenting to you Brentwood Park 7. It's an infill, all-electric, zero-energy-ready community in Portland, Oregon. And just a quick background on me, I studied urban planning, but I've been in home building for a um, better part of 10 years. And it took me uh, the majority of that uh, where I was just building as business as usual to code or to the very minimum incentives that you would get for green home building. I took this class, it blew my mind. And now I look at building a completely different in a completely different way. Slide. So here's just kind of a zoomed out uh, picture. I didn't have an aerial photo, but the project separated north and south with all the roofs oriented to the south to maximize solar exposure, seven homes total. Uh, there's a pedestrian right away, right down the middle. Um, and this was built by Green Canopy Node. Green Canopy Node's mission is to build homes, relationships, and businesses that help regenerate communities and environments. Slide. So why am I here? I'm here because I'm an SHP graduate and I learned a lot from this course. I wanted to share how it helped us achieve some of our goals for building homes that are airtight, healthy, efficient. And I hope that the presentation illustrates how applying lessons from SHP can benefit us as we all work to improve our communities and our homes. And some of the favorite things I liked, oh, just go back real quick. Some of the favorite things, my favorite things from the course was just tapping into the instructor experience. Like the instructors with SHP are some of the best builders um, around and being able to bounce questions off them uh, was, uh, and, then, and then also my peers and go back and forth and see how that works in, in actual site visits was invaluable to me. Um, and then this was also really, truly my first introduction into building science, which, I mean, if you haven't, if you haven't read anything on building science, just understanding the why for how this, why we do things, how it all works, it really arms you with a better toolkit to go in and then assess situations out in the field when you're building homes and understand how to make the best decision to achieve your goal. Slide. 
All right. So um, as part of our mission to regenerate communities and reduce our impacts on climate change, many of our projects kind of contain or omit certain elements. Uh, so we typically have limited car parking because we're not trying to just encourage that the car is the dominant mode of transportation. We're located near bus or transit lines, bike lanes, um, have non-residential uses that you can walk to. Uh, today, though, I'm just going to kind of focus in on how we work to get to our goals as related to directly to the building. So specifically an airtight building envelope, uh, some durability aspects and a little bit of health. So this is the, the site plan of our project. Um, it's got everything that you could ever not want or want, depending on how you look at it in a project. So public right of way, dedication, street lights, uh, sewer water main extensions, paving, um, all the things. Um, but it came out, we're really happy with the project. It took about a year to do the land development and all the building and get paved out. It's Earth Advantage Platinum, which is currently the highest uh, rating that you can get from Earth Advantage, zero energy ready. And it's our first subdivision, zero energy ready by Green Canopy Node. Uh, slide. A lot of details, um, but the first thing I guess I wanna say is that this, what we did here can be easily replicated. So any home builder can go in and do what we did. We didn't do anything uh, special. Um, there's not a huge learning curve to any of the additional details we did to get to a really tight building envelope. Um, and so we used two by six standard construction, the first floor 16 inch on center spacing, but the second and third floor, we did 24 inch on center, um, insulated headers, R23 dense pack cellulose, again, something easy that you can actually get your money back on incentives. Um, and then we did a self adhered weather resistant barrier, which if you're familiar with that, it's like a giant sticker, airtight vapor open sticker that you use in, in lieu of uh, something that you would staple onto the building. We found that that kind of helps with getting to uh, a more airtight objective. Um, we tried something new where we installed OSB on the ceiling for a ventilated attic, taped the seams there, and then made our connection at the top plate to the OSB ceiling with tape and to top it off, we did arrow barrier. We've always wanted to try and get down to below one ACH 50 on our blower door test scores. And we, we did achieve that here. So arrow barrier definitely helped us out with that. We've gotten to about 1.2 uh, with just standard air sling approaches, but uh, we're, we're pretty happy that we got below that one ACH 50 benchmark. And then things that are, uh, it's an all electric home. So heat pumps are our go-to, they're readily available. They're they're becoming more and more popular in the market and they're incredibly efficient um, as far as energy usage goes. Um, the homes, there's two plan types. They range from about 2000 to just under 2200 square feet. Our lot size is incredibly small and efficient. So the amount of land that we're using for each home, very efficient. And they're all three bed, two and a half bathrooms with exterior storage rooms and conduits already installed for future solar and future car chargers. Slide. Um, and then other low hanging fruit that we did to maintain sustainability aspects are just low flow, low water use fixtures, capturing all of our rainwater and infiltrating that on site. And then using materials that aren't off gassing, that are low or no VOC um, materials, rapid renewable things like bamboo, and then using products that are certified by third party um, like Green Guard to make sure that we're putting healthy materials inside of the house. Um, because our air, our homes are so airtight, we have two spot energy recovery ventilators. Um, for people who are kind of intimidated by the thought of doing an ERV or HRV system, if you can install a bath fan, you can install a spot energy recovery ventilator. So um, if you're just starting to get into a point where you wanna make an airtight building and you need fresh air, there are easy pathways into this that work effectively and um, can be easily sourced and installed without a huge learning curve. And all of our homes have a sense monitor in the electrical panels that the end users can learn, um, hey, how am I using my electricity in my building? Can I adjust my behavior and my usage of energy, which also helps us all get to our objective of reducing our impact on the, on the environment. Slide. 
So one of the things we learned in SHP is continuity is key. Um, Stefan, I remember being in class and he was like, put your pen down on your paper, draw a line around your building. And if you don't pick up your pen, you've got a continuous air barrier. And that's what we tried to do here. I, I use that technique out there um, like I was drawing around the building. And you know, you, you quickly find that you'll run into places where, hey, I've got a, a cantilever here or a deck or this roof eve. How do I how do I maintain that continuous air barrier? And they're very simple ways that you can approach that and um, doesn't have to be so complicated. But uh, so the continuous air barrier is key. We don't, we don't want all this energy we're using to heat or cool our home to escape out into the, into the air outside. That's just, um, we wanna reduce the amount of energy we use. And one of the easiest ways that I've learned that we can do that is to get an airtight enclosure, uh, a building envelope. Um, that got a little tricky when we learned from the city and the fire department that we needed to install fire sprinklers in our, um, we we're gonna put a whole bunch of holes in the ceiling. Uh, so there, there were these uh, things we had to navigate, but I just referred back to what I learned in SHP. We came up with a, a way to build boxes around our fire sprinklers and seal those up. And we were able to get our ACH down with a bunch of holes in the lid. Um, and then on top of that, for durability, we have a half inch rain screen installed on the exterior of the building um, that provides us with a capillary break. If any water gets past the cladding, it gives it an opportunity to uh, dry out and uh, maintain the integrity of our building envelope. Slide. Here's some photos of um, some of the details we used. Um, there's rigid foam under the slab. We wrapped the vapor barrier over the stem wall of the foundation. And then when we brought our, um, our bottom plate down, we, we made a connection to the foundation to make sure that the floor to wall connection was air sealed. And then in the picture with the roof trusses, we wrapped WRB over the top plate. And then when we attached our OSB lid to the underside of the trusses, we taped that together. So there's our, our continuous line. We're making that red line around the building envelope. Um, that, that box, the orange pipe, represents the sprinklers in the vented attic. And the, the solution we came up with to air seal the lid while um, not tampering with any of the mechanisms of the fire sprinklers, we, we fully enclosed the fire sprinklers and sealed that off. And then the last picture is the, uh, the product we use is Henry Blue Skin. There are lots of different uh, self-adhered WRBs, but um, you can see how there are vertical strips on the right side of that building. That's the beginning stages of installing our rain screen strips in, in order to give us that break between the wall and the cladding. And then you can see an area where we had to pay attention to at the entry porch, that cantilever there is something that we had to make sure that after it was insulated, we went back and made a continuous, uh, wrap that WRB under that, under that, uh, under those floor joists to make sure that we had that continuous air barrier. Slide. Let me, uh, sorry, it's, it's not advancing. Try it again. There you go. Cool. So I'll just um, energy performance scores are a good way to kind of measure where we are with um, comparable code built homes. Um, so you can see uh, in the first few columns that we're about 50% at the time of the rating uh, more efficient than your average code built home was. Um, and that in doing so, we're using a lot less electricity. We're mitigating. Um, greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide that would have otherwise been utilized if we had a less efficient home. So we are part of the solution, I'd like to say. And then our blower door test scores, you can see our lowest was 0.88 ACH50, which we're super, super happy with. Um, we got up to 1.24 on the highest end, probably some, some spots we didn't get to um, seal correctly or fully, but we're still very happy with that. And it's my understanding that you can be even higher than that and still get to net zero, net zero energy ready. Um, slide. Uh, 
And just real quick on, on uh, some materials that we use health, uh, like that Live Edge Lab was sourced from Sustainable Northwest Woods, which is a great place to get sustainable materials. Um, the floors, bamboo, you know, that's rapidly renewable. You can see the ductless mini split, which is a high efficiency heating system on, on the wall there, slide. And then just the other floor plan here, just wanted to quickly show you above the kitchen island, you can see the energy recovery ventilator. It basically looks like a fan. It's bringing in your fresh air. It's expelling your stale air. It has some energy conversion, so you're not losing all the energy that you have. And it has it provides some level of filtration, not to level of smoke. You're going to have to get into a higher end HRV or ERV system for that. But it does a great job if you're just getting into um, production or spec homes and you want to try and get to net zero, net zero energy ready, and you need an ERV system, um, there are easy ways to get into it. Slide. So just to wrap it up, um, SHP gave me a lot of tools that I use to this day on our current and active projects. Um, I still keep in touch with, with lots of our, um, our call, um, my peers from the class. And I think Personally, it's the best resource that I know of um, to help home builders uh, prepare for the future. Slide. And that's it. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. That was fantastic. What a really, really cool project. I love the community aspect of the project. And yeah, it's really hard to get that kind of efficiency out of a site, um, you know, and actually have a parking spot for everyone to. <laughs> So that's really, really great. Uh, I loved it. One um, question that I have, I think we're going to have one here in a second too out of the chat, was just uh, windows. What kind of windows you use, um, performance, just, you know, curious, uh, you know, especially when you're trying to do something on spec, what, what you're able to find. Yeah, our, you know, our go-to is still, um, we haven't, we haven't gotten to that level on spec where we're doing high performance windows. So we're using a uh, a, a sturdy vinyl frame window. Um, we're requesting that we're at a 0.26 on the U value and we're doing low E. Um, half the buildings here, um, we did limit the amount of glazing on the south side, half wasn't. Um, it was kind of hard to pick and choose kind of optimal solar exposure on the windows. We opted to go for focusing more on solar production, but um, 0.26 on the U value final windows. Yeah. Great. Great. Ali, do we have any other questions we want to hit from? I can see one right now. Was it difficult to install the OSB on the ceiling? Yes. This is from Ian Nemo. Not for me, but for, for our trade partner, it was uh, it was a little bit difficult, and um, it was it was to be honest, kind of an experiment for us. Um, the original detail for this project showed rigid foam on the the lid, and then a conditioned attic. Um, that being said, with the way the trusses were, we still would have had additional details we would have had to address to get that airtight red line all the way around that envelope. So we thought, let's try this out. We've seen it done before. I've seen it. Um, I've learned about it actually in SHP. And it worked out really well, especially with sealing this fire sprinkler boxes to something um, that gave us that attachment point. A but couple I, more, sorry, a couple oh. of quick questions on that too. Is um, so assuming there's drywall that went over the OSB. Kyle asked about that, but also, yeah. um, was there any kind of electrical chase, or was that all done behind uh, the OSB? And yeah, how did you accomplish any kind of recessed lights? Yeah, so we eliminated any recessed lights in the ceiling. Uh, we used pancakes and flush mount fixtures, made sure those were sealed. The ERV on the third floor we installed in the wall, as well as anything else we could. Uh, like the, these homes are wired for speakers. Um, so the speakers were also put on the wall. And we were doing all that work to get things out of the lid or not have penetrations. And the city hit us with the fire sprinklers. But um, like I said, yeah, we, we came up with a solution for that. Limiting those penetrations, though, is key. And did you get a sense on the arrow barrier? Did you check before? Um, they Did you do an ACH, a blow door test, for instance, before you used arrow barrier and then after? Or is it just kind of a, an after effect? Yeah, we always try and get a mid-construction blow door test done. 
we didn't get an, uh, a reading during the mid construction blower door test. It was more so going around and feeling. And we thought we had pretty much most everything. Aero Barrier does do a test um, before they start uh, installing their product. And they did show a significant reduction. Uh, I don't have a, a, a independent uh, blower door test though to compare to. Awesome. Well, thank you, Mark. That's a fantastic presentation. And I want to kind of keep moving everyone along so we can get on to the next one. We we'll, might hopefully have a little bit of extra question time at the end. But uh, again, awesome job. Thank you, Mark. Really appreciate it. All right, moving on. Go ahead, Grace. Hi, yeah, so I'm Grace Wager. I am the site supervisor for Ben Redmond Habitat for Humanity. Um, so my job is anything from making sure we're sticking to a timeline. I order materials. I also manage um, our subcontractors, our volunteers, staff, um, and AmeriCorps members, which is basically a 10 and a half month service with our affiliate. So they work with us on every day. Um, and it's actually how I started at Habitat as well. I was an AmeriCorps member and then I got hired onto staff afterwards. So they're really learning a lot of um, valuable skills in that 10 and a half months. And I really wanted to highlight that as well as what we learned in SHP because they're all learning these sustainable tactics as well. So um, yeah, go ahead and advance to the next slide. Thanks. So uh, we built 11 homes in West Bend that are all net zero. And previously we had only built five houses a home uh, a year. So we've not only doubled that, but now we also have gone completely net zero with this um, building. So we're really proud of what we've achieved here and to be able to build on the west side of Bend. If you're not from Central Oregon, it's a very desirable area. We were donated the land, which allowed us to do that. And that presented its own challenges as well. Um, but yeah, we're very proud of the community we built there. So you can see this is the final shot of looking down the line of homes and we have this communal sidewalk going down the middle. We really tried to emphasize um, the community aspect of the, of the community as well. Um, yeah, if we can advance to the next slide. Thank you. So yeah, I did graduate at SHP in 2021 and we started building prior to that. We started this project in December, 2020. And I can definitely tell you that um, what I learned I was taking SHP pretty much that whole time. And as I was learning more and gaining more skills, our building definitely improved. Things started running a lot more smoothly. I was able to communicate with subcontractors more effectively. So it was really invaluable to this huge achievement that we were able to do this year. Slide, thank you. So like I said, um, this is called our Northwest Cottages um, project. It is in West Bend. We achieved zero energy certification. And we were really, we had been building um, zero energy ready prior to this. And we decided to take the next step with this. One reason was because we actually couldn't get um, gas to this site. So that was kind of a drive over the edge of like, we might as well go all electric, go all net zero. And the impact that that has on our family is really huge. And that's something I really wanna to touch on later in the presentation. Um, so you can see what we've achieved here. Um, we did our 21 bats in our walls. We did our 60 blow-in insulation. We also did dowel board on the outside that was one inch and it was R5, um, all continuous around the exterior of the homes. We did healed trusses as well. So we were able to get 18 inches of that blow-in insulation in the attic um, throughout the entire attic space, which is really helpful. We did uh, standard two by six, 24 on center, um, framing that presented some challenges with our siding um, that I learned later on through the SHP class, how to overcome some of those. So like I said, our first home, um, it's still a very quality home, don't get me wrong, but we definitely learned, as I learned more through the SHP program, we were able to overcome these obstacles a lot easier. Um, we did only get a two ACH on our blower door test, which we were hoping to be a little bit lower than that, but because these homes are all under a thousand square foot, that kind of skews that rating a little bit. So we're very happy with getting two air changes per hour. Um, one of our major air sealing techniques is caulking studs because it's very cheap and it's very accessible to do with volunteers, which we rely very largely on volunteer labor. Um, most volunteers are 
unskilled and this is something that really anybody could do. Um, we were able to get funding for Aero Barrier, which was great. So that helped us to achieve a lower ACH as well. Um, we did U24 windows, ductless heat pumps, mini splits. Um, we have a heat pump, it's a 50 gallon heat pump um, water heater. And I believe the UEF on that was like 3.45. Um, yeah, slide. So again, we're using low flow faucets. Um, one of the things that I think is really cool is we used reused turf in our landscaping. So we did all zero scaping, but the original landscape plans had called for grass and we decided not to do that to eliminate water usage. And instead we went with this turf that used to be a football field of a local high school, which was really kind of neat. Um, yeah, and we have solar, so we have 6,700 watts of solar in each home, which is amazing for the homeowners that get to take advantage of that. Um, so yeah, I just really wanted to focus on being able to do this affordably. Um, that's one of the biggest things I learned from the SHP course is you have to do what is available to you. And there's so many wonderful things that people are able to do because maybe their budget's a little higher than ours. They might have different resources. Um, but we just had to do what was available to us. And we re relied a lot on our community. We did find out about a lot of funding and incentives through SHP and through Earth Advantage that allowed us to build this um, community. I just wanted to shout out Vicki Wooster's on this and she designed these homes for us, which is super cool. And she's an SHP professional as well. So that's cool that she's here. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about some of the challenges we faced in this and um, the integrated design process is something I really wanted to highlight as well because we learned since at the beginning of this project, we actually didn't know that we were going to be fully solar and we didn't know that we we're going to be fully net zero. So we had learned in retrospect that having that initial meeting with all of your subcontractors and going over the entire um, idea is, is really critical. And now we've done that on our next project. So slide. So we were able to do this because we were building small. Like I said, all the homes are under a thousand square foot. Um, there are four, four floor plans. Most of them are single level. We did have a few um, two-story homes, again, all under a thousand square foot. Um, we had a how many homes? We had four three bedrooms and the rest were all two bedrooms, two baths. Um, and the floor plans allowed us to use really short plumbing runs, which is more efficient for heating the water as well as water usage. Um, they allowed us to, most of the homes got two mini split units. A couple of them got three because of the layout of the home. Um, you can see here the solar array on the, I think this is on the west side of the home. Again, when we initially designed the layout of the homes, we didn't know we were doing solar or else we probably would have maybe tried to get them on the south facing side there, but we still are able to get lots of sun here in central Oregon. So that works well. Um, and we were allowed to, this is a very tiny lot that we built on. I forget the square foot of each lot, but it's very close quarters. I think it's like two foot to the lot lines from the home. And we were still able to get high density, which means that we are serving our community better um, there's a lot of need for affordable housing in our community because it's, the prices here have just, they're insane. So we were able to do that while still having um, privacy. You have a standalone home, you don't have to live in an apartment. So slide. This was one of our two story homes and I've put the layout of the house here. As you can see, it's, it's an open concept. Um, we made really good use of the small space. This one is just under a thousand square foot. And the simple structures, as you can see, most of our structures are, are just square and that makes the material more efficient. You're not wasting a bunch of material, cutting really intricate designs. It makes insulating easier. It makes the uh, air sealing easier, the weather resistant barrier easier. So simplicity really paid off for us. Um, that's how we were able to achieve it on, on a budget. Um, and we did not do passive solar here, but I will say that the, the layout of the windows here, Vicki did a very great job of utilizing natural light. And during the day, you really don't need any lights on at all because every room has wonderful natural light. So slide. 
So as I said, some of our challenges at the beginning were definitely um, being able to communicate with subcontractors. A lot of them are kind of stuck in their ways or maybe don't have the knowledge or practice of what we were doing. So um, that was a challenge for me at first, had he, having not finished the SHP program, by the end, I was able to be more knowledgeable and give them ideas. And when you know what you're talking about, you're able to more effectively communicate that with others as well. Um, and we work with volunteers a lot. So there's challenges there. Like I said, most of them are unskilled. But as I've, as I've learned, really, I think anyone can kind of learn this and being able to teach it to other people is really cool. Um, and as you can see in this picture here, they're putting up the blue board on the outside of the house. Um, pretty low skilled job, right? You just need a hammer and some cap nails and a ladder and there you go. And we obviously are making sure that they're not busting up the foam when they're putting the cap nails in, but that sort of thing, you just have to keep an eye on quality. Um, everything in these homes is it's so important that it's done properly. So anything from you know sealing the windows and putting that tape on the windows or even caulking the studs, making sure that they've properly adhered the caulk to each surface, the stud to the sheeting so that it actually does its job of you know preventing um, air leakage there. So just quality insurance on this job was very important. It's, it's, it's HP really helped me with that. Um, and as I said, this land was donated to us, which probably was because nobody else really wanted to develop it. We had huge boulders that we had to remove that we ended up reusing to build a retaining wall, which was great. We were able to use the stuff that we had in the land and use it for a different purpose. Um, it was difficult to get utilities in there. And when we started the project, not knowing the final design being net zero, there are some things there that we probably could have done a little bit differently, um, but stuff that we've learned and on our next project we are implementing. So um, yeah, next slide. So this is my biggest thing. I think that it's so important that sustainable it should be accessible because it is most often people that are going to be most greatly impacted by global warming by not having the resources to have that buffer um, between them and their environment. And so many of our families are living in really not great situations. Maybe it's a con converted garage that's full of mold and it doesn't have proper heating um, or ventilation. So, and it's the cost savings per month that they're experiencing. So at being able to put in, they're spending like maybe $10 on energy bills a month versus what I pay, which is way more than that. <laughs> um, so being able to put a hundred bucks in your pocket each month means that they can spend that on their child's edu education. They can go on family vacations. They can have a safety net um, that they don't currently have. And they're living in a healthier home. They're, all of our homes had ERV systems. Um, they're all built with low VOC materials. We, we really thought that was important to take care of our families um, and just give them a quality home at an affordable rate. So we are currently building 18 units now in Redmond, Oregon. They're not full net zero. So again, we have to do what is in our reach within our budget, within the funding that we are able to get, the incentives that we are able to get. And so this time we are able to get 3.5 kilowatts of solar. We are all, we're still implementing the same building practices. We're doing the exterior rigid foam. We're caulking our studs. We're um, building really airtight buildings still. And I think that Habitat, if we can do it in Central Oregon, which is not an easy place to build or live, it's quite expensive, but if we can do it, I really wanna be an example that I think any builder should be able to do it. Um, and just to emphasize that if, even if you can't go 100%, you can do something. Um, and there's strategic ways, creative ways to get around challenges and SHP really helped me um, identify some of those and implement change in the way that we build. That's it, thank you. Awesome, Grace, that was a fantastic project. I love Habitat for Humanity. 
So in a lot of different habitats, regional habitats have taken the SHP over the years. And yeah, it's just an amazing organization and really love the work that you do. Uh, again, people can ask questions in the chat. I'll read those through. My general question is, you know, you did mention a few times um, lessons learned and maybe lessons that you like learned, wished you could have implemented. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Uh, what in particular do you comes to mind or like, uh, I wish, you know, next time I'd like us to focus on this. What would that you know, be? it's funny because some of them are so small, like some of it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't catch the plumber when he put a vent right where the solar array is going to go. Um, so really small things like that, that kind of seem silly now in retrospect, because I would never, I, that would never even happen again. <laughs> um, now that I have the knowledge and that I do now. Um, and some of the other ones, I think we really could have gone a little bit lower with our ACH and our air sealing techniques. That was a hurdle that we had with some of our subcontractors. They just like to punch holes in the wall, it seems like. Um, and so that was kind of a learning curve for them. The electrician comes to do his trim out and he lost a wire. So he's poking a hole in the wall that has just had arrow barrier. Um, so some of those techniques that, uh, now that we are using them, a lot of the same subcontractors. So on this next project we're on right now, it's going a lot smoother, just that they they recognize it, they know what's going on, they've had the experience, and I'm able to also mitigate those things a little bit more. That's awesome. Yeah, your um, your designer, architect, uh, Vicki Wooster, mentioned that um, maybe Aero Barrier had gotten it down to an ACH of one. Was that possible? or um... I went the highest ACH score that we got here. Um, again, we had 11 homes and they all varied a little bit here, but two was, it, it was our highest end there, so. Okay, that makes. May I add something, Stefan? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big challenges in designing these, especially for solar ready and solar is the way the lots were laid out, mm -hmm. which as Grace pointed out was before uh, we knew what was, really going to happen is they're all narrow going north south so there was no choice but to have roof lines going north south and we worked with the solar company uh, he and i worked together with the roof lines that we had and he it it required a couple of extra panels on each house but he was able to put the panels on the east side which he said would get a little more gain than on the west side. But we only had a couple of areas on the two-story houses where there was anything that could be south-facing. If there were anything on a do-over of that project, it would be to try to lay the lots out more appropriate for solar. Um, the other thing I want to say is I was doing the SHP course the same time Grace was, and uh, although we didn't know that, um, yeah, this was my project for SHP too, and there was a lot I learned, mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't out in the field like she was, so I didn't have as direct an impact. Um, yeah, and and Vicki, uh, we might need to hold some of the comments toward the end because we do have two more presenters uh, that we're going to move forward. So yeah, well, I have to I have to leave for a meeting, so I just wanted to get my two cents in. Uh, it was an honor to work on that project, and if Habitat can do it. Anybody can do it. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you. Thank Vicky. you so much, Vicki. Yeah, huge, uh, huge applause to Vicki Wooster and Grace Wager for the Habitat Humanity Project. That was awesome. Uh, but yeah, moving on, we've got Maggie Bates. And uh, I don't want to take any more of anyone's time. So I'll just hand over to Maggie. Did we lose Maggie? <gasps> Thank you. Um, I'm Maggie. I designed the project I'm going to share, and I'm lucky to be able to manage the design department of A1 Design Build. We're a worker-owned cooperative, and um, we're also, um, you know, design build all the way through. So uh, we design it and we build it. I'm pretty grateful for the entire team I work with and I'm really grateful for this client that found us so that we were able to do this project. It's a pivotal house for our company. Um, we've really kind of uh, upped our game and I'm excited to show it, uh, show it to you. 
Next, please. Okay, um, so this is the project. It's situated on the edge of town near a lake. It's on a corner lot. Um, it is in a watershed, which affected things. Uh, the team was not limited to, but did include a, a structural engineer, a civil engineer, um, an estimating team, our production crew, and a slew of subcontractors. Next, please. Um, and so why am I here? Um, well, uh, I was uh, just trying to expand my knowledge and I took the sustainable home professional course and loved it. Um, integrated design is mentioned in there a lot and it fits perfectly with our process. We're known for front loading our projects with research and lots of communication. Um, the knowledge I gained from this training helped me realize that the house that we already were working on, uh, it was already underway, was really right on track, but it gave me some, you know, it sort of really beefed up my confidence and we ended up testing it and we were, we were um, extremely happy with the outcome. It is a net zero energy ready home and we didn't actually expect that. I think that all of this together helped us move that direction. Next, please. Um, so the Cable Street home is uh, 1,682 square feet. It's a three bedroom, two bath. This drawing that I'm showing you really describes the envelope system that make this a high performance building. You might also notice the simple shape. Um, the client really, really appreciated simplicity that look and feel um, of the finished product needed to be simple for him. And uh, he wanted uh, some sustainable features that I had studied, but I hadn't used them yet. Uh, our general manager suggested the Foswell material to the client and the client liked that idea. So this along with their request for solar and water catchment, this became the most complicated simple building I've ever worked on. Next, please. Uh, generally, the insulation is foam, uh, but what was not taken into account when measuring the R value is the thermal mass that's created by the Foswell block system. The walls uh, with plaster on both sides are nearly 14 inches thick. The Foswell blocks themselves are 12 and then you coat it on both sides. We found the Figus Fen trim um, was compatible with both the Foswell block and the, and the plaster that had to go over the top, so that was awesome. Uh, the windows are triple pane. Uh, we have multiple heat pumps uh, that I'll talk about later. Um, we continue to monitor this home uh, to, and stay in pretty close contact with the homeowner to make sure everything is living up to expectations. Uh, we've got both um, electrical monitoring, monitoring and air monitoring. Uh, the water collection, can you go back please? On the slide. Thanks. Uh, the water collection was a, su a super interesting part of the design and I will touch on that a bit later. The finishes were chosen um, based on values of having a healthy home and a healthy planet. The plaster is no VOC, the countertops are paper stone, the floors are natural cork, linoleum, and ash and the lighting is all LED. Uh, we have a, an HRV in here, a Zender that'll keep the air clean and healthy uh, with some pretty great filtration capabilities. And we're all, all very interested to see how the solar panel energy plays out. Um, so solar is successful here, even in our cloudy, rainy weather. We've done it on other projects. Um, the, the HERS rating, uh, was done third party verifier and <clears throat> the third party verifier showed that we, the annual energy use was gonna be pretty low. Uh, the solar company thought it was gonna be a little bit higher than that and that agreed with my rough calculations, but we've only had it up a few months. So, you know, we'll see how it plays out, but it is supposed to be zero, zero energy home. Next, please. 
Okay, so we'll get into the blocks now. In addition to structural integrity and fire protection um, of the block, the poured concrete is on the inside of the insulation that you can see in this slide on the right or the photo on the right. Um, so in the winter, so basically that concrete and rebar are on the warm side of the wall. So in the winter, when you heat with the heat pump and the sun, the the, the house is going to get um, warm and it's going to hold that heat and the house will hold heat longer than a typical wall construction. The blocks are made of inert wood chips and cementous binder. The wood chips are made from recycled pallets that are diverted from a landfill. Foswell shares that the wood chips are mineralized in a proprietary process that removes the sugars from the wood which makes the wood chips um, inert and not susceptible to rot or insects, which is one of my first questions. Uh, so it's 85% of the upcycled wood and 15% of the lime and mineral mix. They're dry stacked and then filled with rebar and concrete in the cavities. The disadvantages um, of this is there just the number of pieces you have to handle. Uh, it was a, a physical challenge and it added to time and in the field and it caught us by surprise. That's, you know, really the, the, big, the big thing that we kind of struggled with, but we got through it. Um, next slide, please. Though it seems like a concrete slab floor, block walls and a SIPS roof would be unforgiving when it comes to uh, planning the electrical, wire and the ducting and the pipes and all. It's not, you can actually make a change in the field. Um, it's definitely harder than stick frame to make a change, but honestly, we didn't want to test it and we really didn't have to test it. I think possibly we moved one light fixture over a few inches at one point. I think that was about the only thing we changed in the, in the envelope. Um, the integrated design was a really great solution for this because everybody un understood their part from the get-go. Pre-planning and communication with the trades <clears throat> was critical in the design phase and that continued through the entire project, thank goodness. To avoid bumping out the interior of the FOS wall, I only ran electrical in, in the FOS wall and all the plumbing ran under the slab and through the interior walls. Um, okay, next please. So uh, if we could do it again, uh, we, would we would not have cut each block to create the angled rake walls that you see here. Boswell makes a panel material that we used over the SIPs um, on the clear story wall. You can't see that. It's a small wall on the opposite side of the building. And we also used it on a corner post. What we could have done in retrospect is we could have ended the FOS wall for the main structure on a horizontal run and then added like a sip or a stick frame uh, for the structure of that rake and covered it with the FOS wall panel. Once the stucco was on, you never would have known the difference and you could have gotten the same R value. Yeah, we really would have done that different, um, but it's okay, we got through that one too. <laughs> Generally speaking, this was really labor intensive material. There was a sigh of relief from the project manager um, that, and he was back in familiar territory once the blocks were up and the job returned to a familiar flow. And if I haven't said it before, I really appreciate those guys on the, on the right, Mark and Eric, they did a lot of that work. Okay, next please. Every room in the house has a mechanical access pathway. On the first floor, there's either a trust floor system overhead or in the vaulted areas, there's a closet with a drop ceiling um, where the mechanicals have a pathway. Uh, the access was helpful when roughing in all the pipes and the flexible ducts. It's also there for the future if the homeowner needs to add an electrical wire or a pipe somewhere, there's, there's a pretty easy pathway through the building. He, doesn't, he would not have to get into the, the envelope to do that. Next, please. So um, windows always look so easy in the finished product. And these windows um, are recessed in from both sides and we don't have trim to cover up what we're doing really. 
Um, drawing the detail that leads to that photo that looks very pretty took me several phone calls with the window supplier, uh, with the plaster artisan, and then plenty of in-house chats with the production crew. But we came up with a system that worked and was installed as planned. And the important parts of the window that don't show in the finished photo are the graphite infused foam that break the thermal bridge of the buck out. Um, the plaster friendly fen trim was awesome and the strategically hidden plastic screed so so everything uh, works with the plaster. I'm still enamored by the sculpted look. I love it. It feels old world when you're in there. The plaster details were actually pretty new for me and I depended on the plaster expert Tanner over at Earthen Frameworks to talk me through a lot of what was going to happen. Um, where the plaster surface met other components. The good and the not so good, um, the, the exterior natural hydraulic line plaster acts as a weather and an air barrier all in one. And it's no VOC with a pig, pigmented finish. So it's, it's just all together there. Um, but removing, so on the inside, we also did plaster and removing the moisture from inside the building was another story. It, the drying uh, of an entirely plastered structure was challenging. The next time we'll use more fans earlier on and uh, we will, if we can, we would stage the plastering on the interior uh, so we wouldn't overwhelm the interior with moisture. It would add a cost though to do that. So we'd have to plan extra cost and a little extra time. The client really wanted water collection. Um, so you see the double 400 gallon cisterns that they should catch all the water from the roofs that are sent there by wet conveyance and then send it by a pump to the toilets, the washing machine and the um, garden hose. Uh, if there's any extra, it's gonna enter the 230 feet of buried drain pipe that was specifically designed to keep all the stormwater on site. Uh, I feel really lucky that I knew both a water catchment specialist and a plumber who knew how to integrate the system into the into the actual plumbing in the house. I, because I, I these these were the things I didn't have a clue about when I started the project and I'm so grateful for those folks. The Zender HRV um, you see below that provides the balanced ventilation uh, with fresh air being pumped into the bedrooms and the living room and stale air coming out of the kitchen and bathrooms. And it captures the heat before it leaves the building. It filters air as it comes in. I love the Zender. The main heat source is an electric heat pump. The hot water is also a heat pump and the dryer is a heat pump. Uh, appliances are Energy Star, including an, uh, a, re a a refrigerator and then the induction range and the recirculating hood, I don't actually think they qualify for Energy Star, but they're very efficient in the sense that we didn't put a hole. And actually I'll talk about that. Um, yeah, the in addition to the windows and the doors, there's only eight penetrations above grade in the house. And that includes the three outdoor lights because those are penetrations too. We don't have ducts for oven hood, gas, appliances, or a dryer. Um, there were no penetrations in the roof at all. The, all the plumbing is close together on one end of the building. And so all the plumbing venting was able to com come into one uh, pipe that's, that's vented out the wall um, up, on the, up high on the back of the building. So um, it really helped me with my envelope. Uh, okay, um, so I think uh, where where we're going to go as a company, we we do new homes and remodels, and we've leveled up to become high performance builders. And uh, part part of the way we got there is to take training like this. And I so appreciate that a program like this is out there. It was very doable in an amount of time that was reasonable, and it was right on. It was right on. All the information was awesome. Um, underneath uh, the integrity that would come from building buildings that are durable, efficient, 
comfortable. I really find that it's important to not forget the integrity in the working relationships, which actually speaks a bit to that integrated design. You know, it's about caring for the client and the coworkers and the community outside of, of your project and the planet ultimately. Um, so my goal and our company's goal is really the same. It's just having a lot of integrity in high performance design. Perfect. We um, do you have one more speaker. So Maggie, are you okay holding on for the extended speaker session? Um, sure. And I, I got I do. So Allie, we do reason, have. Allie, we do still. We're on time. Okay. Um, according to the schedule that you forwarded. So we, you have three more minutes for questions if you wanted to okay. do that. I did have okay. one question um, that I saw, and just Ian had asked. You know the. Um, the dimensions on the FAS wall, were they really consistent kind of going through height width length? Did you have any issues kind of matching um, your, your lines up as you, you were building? Um, well, they, it, when you put them together, basically a run will grow a little bit. And so you have to end up shaving one of the blocks in the center. Our, our folks are, they're awesome at paying attention to detail and wanting to do a really good job. The Foswell guy came on site and he he basically said to them, hey, we're not building a piano here, you know. <laughs> so did they have trouble? No. I mean, they're exacting people. Um, I think they they that the Foswell blocks worked really well that way. I think it was fine. Everything's lined up quite well. And it is expected that they're going to grow a little bit and you shave in the center. That's great. I we did built a Faswell home in 2009, mm -hmm. and it's really interesting to see. It's you know technology has been around for a while. I loved loved that project. The line mm -hmm. plaster is just an awesome um, product to work with too. And yeah, just so nice to see more of those projects going up. Um, but as Ali indicated, we need to keep moving. That was a fantastic project from. Um, a1 design build. And thank you so much, Maggie Bates, for presenting that. Uh, let's move on to the next presentation. Perfect. And my apologies, the uh, slides are advancing on their own on a timer. So Maggie, if you felt a little bit uh, rushed on that, that was, uh, <laughs> so I'm trying to fix that on the back end. So Ben, should you have that same experience for working on that technical difficulty? No, no problem. It was it was fine. I knew what was going on. I've had that happen to me too. Okay. Great. Okay, Ben. What's up? You're up. All right. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm co-founder of Revel Home. We're a new design build firm in the Portland area. Um, just got started about two years ago and finished the SHP course about a month ago. Um, kind of the direction that we wanted to take with, with our company um, having been new was to figure out how we're gonna solve, solve the climate crisis with the built environment. Um, and the motivation to take the course was to really see the current state of, of sustainable building and high performance building and see, see where the industry, in, industry is at the moment and where it's headed. So, so that was the big, the big re motivation behind taking the course. Um, and really my background was, I spent 10 years, I grew up in construction, so I'm familiar with the industry, um, but I needed to get up to date. I previously spent 10 years in manufacturing. Um, so so man the manufacturing bent is something that I think construction is headed towards. And I, and I see a lot of value in, in the manufacturing process. Um, that kind of helped inform what we selected as a, a building system that we wanted to focus on. Um, so so to, to jump into it, uh, could you go to the next slide, Ali? I have, after having taken the course and doing a bunch of research on my own, um, I really believe that mass timber is the best currently available platform for sustainable building. And, and I'll, I'll justify that here with, with a few points. Um, 
the the first being that it, it allows it allows you to create big spaces um, with smooth structural surfaces. So it, it gives you a lot of design freedom to 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 do what you to do what you want, and in the future to be able to modify things um, without the restrictions of of a, a, a hidden structure. Um, the, the the another aspect that I really like about mass timber is the simplicity. So with this type of building system, you're not commingling uh, different components of a building. For example, you're not mixing the, the structure with the insulation. And I believe that simplicity as well allows a greater de degree of um, freedom when you're altering it in the future, as well as making it easier to implement things uh, like an air barrier. Um, those can be very consistent and that air barrier when it's on the outside of the mass timber panels will be protected from the outside with insulation and from the inside with the panel. And another, another benefit to, to the mass timber building system would be, and it's, it's not necessarily a result of mass timber, but it is symbiotic. And that's to have accessible mechanical, electrical, and plumbing runs. Now, I think the the big reason for that I'll I'll get to a bit later. But but those were the big the big benefits I saw at it, with regard to what I'm focusing on with this talk and and this spec project. Um, but to kind of set the stage at that stage for that, I want to zoom out just a little bit to give some context behind why we chose to, to focus on mass timber um, going forward. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Ali? So as everybody here probably knows, um, the goal is sustainable building. And the big focus for the industry to date, I believe has been the low hanging fruit, which is ca the carbon footprint of the built environment. Uh, the two aspects of that being embodied and operational carbon. And it became, as when I was going through the course, it became very evident to me that the operational carbon footprint of a building is solvable. We've, we've got many techniques to do that. Um, Stefan and, and the ins other instructors have, have shown that it's practical, it's doable. And I would say that that problem is solved. Now, what they're doing with SHP is basically giving all giving the people who take it all the tools to accomplish that. And, and so I think implementation of these solutions is, is, is very important. And that's going to be where that where operational carbon reduction really starts to grow in the future. The other aspect was embodied carbon. And this is another one where I see it is, it's mostly solved. Um, we're aware of it, we have the knowledge and we have the tools to, to reduce the embodied carbon in a structure. Uh, that said, I do, do think we can go further with that and they'll get to that right at the end of the presentation. Um, but it, it, does, it does beg the question, what is next? Um, we, we figured out the carbon accounting thing, but there, the industry as a whole can, I believe, go, go further in addressing more problems. Next slide. So one of the things that was focused on at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the course was actually the health. And I think that's where the industry is headed. Um, it's, it's there in large part, I believe as well. But there's definitely a lot of change happening there. And I think that's where, where things are going to start to change a lot more quickly. And it's going to be adopted very quickly as well, um, especially with the, low, the, the recent context of around COVID and everything. Um, but carbon accounting and climate change altogether are, are not the only thing that we need to start addressing for a sustainable future. This image here is. Is, is basically a reduction of a lot of the issues that many scientists see going forward as, as planetary boundaries or items that are going to threaten our existence on, on this planet. So, and, and I believe that 
the built environment can start to address a lot of these different aspects, even if even if at the in the current moment they're they're not on the radar. Um, and we don't know what those solutions are going to look like or what form they're going to take. Uh, so to kind of set the stage, I wanted to look back at what happened the last hundred years of, of homes and home building. So next slide. So I kind of had just, just did a quick search and wanted to figure out what it was. And it was, it was kind of amazing how much has changed in, in the past hundred years. And just a few points here, toilets, flushing toilets had just become common in the 1920s. Um, a majority of homes didn't have hot running water. So that's a missing, missing, missing system in the building. 35% uh, of homes were electrified. 75% uh, still heated with coal or wood. Phones, phones had come of age, and at least the landline phone had come of age in the last hundred years and has basically become obsolete. So that's a system that was installed in a home that has come and gone. Um, and, and that tells you that, and I don't think that was predicted in the 1920s, what was gonna happen over the hundred, next hundred years. And I believe that we are a bit arrogant if we think we can predict the next hundred years of what's gonna happen. And so it, it's, it, it, it's wise, I believe, to start building homes that, that take that into account. Uh, next slide. So kind of the theme for, for us choosing this, this building system and, and why was the desire to, to take this constant change into account. And we're aiming to build a home that lasts 100 years, maybe 200 years, so that the, the embodied carbon footprint comes down. Uh, over that time period, things are going to change. And as, as sustainable home builders, I believe we need to facilitate those changes and eliminate or reduce the barriers for, for future generations to be able to make those changes to our homes so that we can adopt new technologies. So we need to build buildings that are adaptable, that are able to evolve with a change in use um, and changes in technology. The, the biggest barrier that, that I see currently, because we've, we've done a few remodels now, um, and having grown up in construction, we did mo mainly remodels then, was just the cost of of implementing new things. So for example, just recently, I received a quote of 60 to $70,000 for rewiring a triplex that currently has knob and tube. Old, old system. And they didn't opt to do that upgrade because of the cost. Now, that cost is, is something that if designed intelligently, we can mitigate the impact or reduce that cost in the future when new tech technologies come, come along that are gonna vastly improve quality of life and sustainability. Um, this, this image here is just kind of an illustration of what, what I believe an accessible um, mechanical engine, uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing installation would look like. Um, so for example, just removable panels on soffits would be, would be a great way to allow easy implementation of, of new systems. Now I've got a few others listed here. Uh, those I think are, are items that will slowly change over time. And that's more of an aesthetic and, and perception shift in society. But, but definitely, definitely something that, that will happen over time. Um, the, the, and, and, and to get to my next point, basically, um, the ad adaptable buildings are, 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 are going to be required for, for us to change as quickly as we need to. Um, 
And then moving back even further to the, the embodied carbon of, of mass timber or timber in, in general um, and buildings in general, the, the carbon accounting is another, another reason I like mass timber. Um, next slide, please. So, so timber is a very, it's, it's known that timber is a very sustainable material. Uh, and there, there are many reasons for that. One, because timber is a carbon sink, basically. When sourced responsibly, timber is, is, it pumps carbon dioxide out of the air down into basically the timber that, the wood that it produces and, and into the soil. Um, responsible harvesting and harvesting in general for timber, for, for our homes, um, creates young forests and young forests, young trees, they grow faster and faster growth means more efficient pumps. So we can basically use our buildings as a method of uh, propagating or I should say instigating the use of more timber to me is a good way to, to stimulate the, the, the the pump of the trees can be um, basically putting that CO2 into our buildings. The, and decomposing trees in, in the forest, they also release carbon. So if instead of letting a, a tree die and fall down and decompose, we can take that tree and, and put it in our building. And again, just, just to say the sustainable harvesting is, is a critical key in this supply chain. So systems like, uh, or I should say governing bodies like FSC that, that enable that are, are, are things that are gonna become common. And I think that's almost already the case is there's a lot of demand for FSC timber. Um, and I think mass timber using more, using more wood is, is gonna be a good thing. It's gonna create a bigger market for, for timber, for trees and that cash in that market is actually going to be a resource for better forest management, which is something that ev everybody wants. And I think government agencies are definitely pushing that way. Um, and, and another interesting benefit to timber is that timber doesn't need to come from forests alone. There's, um, uh, next slide, please, Allie. So there's there's a growing a growing body of research and and, and a lot of farmers moving to uh, more regenerative farming practices and one of those practices is called agroforestry. Um, agroforestry is essentially just adding trees to a farming system. You can see in this pic here, it's basically growing crops in between trees. So trees become uh, another another product of a farm. The benefits of this system are you get healthier soils, you can reduce or even eliminate the need for chemical agriculture, and it provides habitat, so you get diversity in, an, in the ecosystem, and it also provides better drought tolerance, and that drought tolerance um, also is applicable to our food system. So this is just kind of a snapshot of the effects that I believe increasing timber usage can actually have in the industry or the system as a whole, looking at the many different links that we've got between our built environment and the materials that we choose and what we're able to accomplish when we consciously direct that spending on, on building. Um, and, and I think the, the biggest takeaway for me from, from the Sustainable Homes Professional course was, was that this is, this is all achievable. We've, we've, I think we've got this figured out, but it is a matter of bringing more people into the fold. And I think that's, that's the real value of, of this course. And, and I'm really excited to be able to present this and, and get feedback. Um, I, like, I like critical questions. So... I'm ready for them. <laughs> awesome, thanks, Ben. That was that was fantastic. Um, really, I love CLT, and I love seeing 
CLT coming onto the market and seeing a lot of it being used, uh, you know, commercial buildings replace the heavy concrete steel structures. And I love the idea of, you know, completely accessible mechanical systems for upgrades and changes in the future. Um, you know what, as you dug through this, uh, what barriers do you see in particular for, you know, uptake of CLT in residential construction? Uh, I think the, the biggest one is going to be cost. I've, I've looked at the cost. I've looked at local producers of, of these panels and, and, and the cost is going to be a big barrier. Um, I think an, another barrier is going to be aesthetic. I don't think accessible um, mechanical runs are, 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 are easy right now to, to sell. <laughs> People wanna see a nice flat white wall. Um, so I do think there's, there's aesthetic barriers to it. That said, I, it, it, the, the industrial chic, if you will, is, is something that is, becomes more and more appealing. So one question we had um, from Michael Feeney is, it looks difficult to wrap the weather barrier on the wall to roof for a CALT um, panel intersection. Is that true? How would you, how, do you, how would you go about doing that? If you thought that through? Um, yeah, definitely. I uh, have, have thought probably too much about all of this. <laughs> um, I really see it as ending the CLT panel at the wall. So kind of your monopoly house um, built structure. And then over that, you would put all your exterior insulation. So your continuous exterior insulation. And, and, and I, do, I do see um, the advantage of eaves. And I think that should be included where possible. And so a, a simple solution would be a, like a vented over roof that gives you basically your rain screen on the roof and you, you can dry to the exterior still and still and still have a very simple to implement air barrier. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ben. I think we are kind of running out of time here and wanna make sure that Ali and I get some time in, in the last few minutes. And those are fantastic presentations. I uh, really look forward to all the work that you guys are going to do in the future as well and want to hear about that. Um, and yeah, again, big, huge thanks to Rebel Home and Ben uh, Bun Bungartz and to all of the speakers here today. And so let's advance that slide, Allie. <laughs> um, I don't know if there are any other just general questions. Um, before we kind of wrap things up here, that anyone wants to pop in, now's the time to kind of squeeze it in if you've got one. So otherwise we're gonna keep moving. I'll keep my eye out for any questions that, that pop up. Allie, anything else on this? Uh, so, so far no more have come through the chat. So we'll conclude with a few wrap ups. Um, so you've heard some four amazing presentations from folks who have taken SHP uh, they even indicated that in the middle of the project, they even changed turnkeyed a little bit and, and brought their buildings in a whole new direction. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. What a great uh, job today. Awesome presentations. Uh, huge shout out to the speakers, Mark Grismore and Grace uh, Wager and uh, Maggie Bates and uh, Ben Bungartz. Thank you so much. Fantastic job. And I look forward to future uh, SHP sessions with you all. So again, if you want to learn about SHP, uh, do uh, go to earthadvantage.org slash SHP online. So thank you all for participating.